previously on a very odd caster. Uh, this year, I decided to pick 10 resolutions uh, that are counterproductive for me. That way I won't be disappointed. And so, without further ado, uh, my first New Year's resolution is to gain weight. My second New Year's resolution folds into the first one. My second New Year's resolution is to exercise less. My third New Year's resolution is to be more impatient when I'm driving in traffic. Now, <clears throat> interestingly enough, right after that little swig of eggnog and Jack, uh, my fourth New Year's resolution is to increase my alcohol intake. And that's a perfect lead into my fifth New Year's resolution, to take up smoking. My sixth New Year's resolution is to swear more when I'm around my kids. My seventh New Year's resolution is to go to church less. My eighth New Year's resolution is to cut back on my household chores. Number nine, my ninth New Year's resolution, to bring up politics with complete strangers. And my 10th and final New Year's resolution is to fall out of touch with old friends. Because uh -huh. they won't be expecting it. Yeah. That's exactly what they won't be expecting. <clears throat> this is the part of the story where it's looking grim for our hero. That's right. I've begun trying to install the ceiling and have run into major issues. Here, I'll show you. Not being a architect or an engineer, I did not account for the intense weight of the drywall. And so getting it to stay put was a little tricky. I've already been to Home Depot to look at other alternative ceilings. Didn't come up with much. Came up with the smaller pieces thing, but I'm thinking, there's no way that all these joists are even. So if I put all these things up, they're all gonna be right? <sighs> Plus I don't wanna buy all those things. And then I have to run some more support beams between the joists. I don't wanna deal with that. So I came up with a mantra as I sat here contemplating whether to get an early start on drinking for this weekend. And here's my mantra. All we are saying is give drywall a chance. So that's what I'm doing. I'm painstakingly, my son's gone, he's at a concert. So it's just me and my ladder and a nice piece of uh, inch and a half thick board that I put there to uh, apply more pressure up there. So I'm going down the rows here, screwing uh, screws in almost all the way, but not quite, and seeing what happens. And if it doesn't work, I'm screwed. Welcome and Happy New Year to another edition of 
a very odd caster. Uh, yes, as you've noticed, I'm wearing black today. And it's not because I'm fixing to paint a portrait, but I'm actually wearing black in solidarity with the grieving football fans in Baltimore and Detroit. Just this last weekend, we had the conference championships and uh, Baltimore lost to Kansas City and Detroit lost to San Francisco. And so we have a 49ers Chiefs Super Bowl, a rematch from four years ago. But as always, if you're a fan, it's how you lose that sticks with you because there's always a bunch of what ifs. And in the case of both the Ravens and the Lions, uh, the blame falls squarely, particularly in Detroit, on the coach or coaching in general. Starting in the uh, AFC game, uh, the Chiefs, you know, they know how to win and uh, they get a little bit of uh, leniency that's odd at times from the referees, but that's a whole other story. Chiefs show up and they know how to win those big games. The Ravens, on the other hand, was sort of like, they were sort of like the schoolyard bully who's used to beating up everybody. And then when somebody turns around and punches them in the nose, they fall apart. Uh, there's a history of that in boxing, by the way. George Foreman, when he was young, and Mike Tyson, both two of the most devastating uh, knockout artists of the past century. Uh, and Sonny Liston as well, going back further. Those three guys were devastating knockout punchers, and they were considered invincible. And each one of them got upset, and they were never the same again. Foreman did have a, a fantastic comeback at an older age, but you get my point. After Foreman lost to Ali, he was never the same. But I digress. So the Ravens, this 2023 season that just wrapped up, were beating the crap out of teams. They went into San Francisco and crushed the 49ers by like 30 some points. Detroit came into Baltimore and they lost by like 40 points. Miami, last game of the season, or second last game of the season, went into Baltimore, Ravens crushed them. So I kept wondering, are the Ravens that good? Or is it just one of these things like with Tyson and Foreman and way back when Sonny Liston, which is like they seem invincible and they're like the bully that's about to get punched in the face. And so I felt like it was all going to come down to if they got into a close game, would they be able to handle it? And they totally unraveled. And that's coaching in part. It's a lot on the players too. But coaches have to mentally prepare players for everything. And the Ravens didn't seem like they were prepared for anything. There's talk about Lamar Jackson being... Uh, not all that when it comes to crunch time or when it comes to playoff time. His record's two and four. You are what your record shows. As great as Jackson is, and I'm, we've never really seen a quarterback uh, that can do the things that he can do. When it comes to playoff time, you're facing the best defenses who are, when you get deep in the playoffs, playing at their absolute peak. And... He hasn't fared too well against that. So that aside, how does coaching fall into that? Well, uh, the Ravens had the number one rushing attack in the league, and they ran the ball like eight times uh, when Jackson wasn't running it via scrambling or design plays or whatever. So they didn't run the ball much. <clears throat> As a result, the Chiefs dominated time of possession in the first half, and the second half was basically a defensive showdown. So, uh, I think, I think uh, the Ravens definitely got outcoached by that dude in the Allstate commercials, uh, the Kansas City coach, um, the Walrus. Yeah, that's right. And interestingly enough, when Harbaugh got home that night, uh, pff, come to find the Walrus had stolen his fries too. Over in the NFC, that was a heartbreaker because being a Cleveland fan, uh, I feel Detroit's pain. And the Lions 
have been actually more inept than the Browns. Hard to believe, I realize. Uh, this was their first championship game in 30 some years. And um, they haven't won an NFL championship since the 1950s, I think 1957, if I recall uh, correctly. That's a long ass time, 67 years. I'd say they're due, right? And they had it. That's the problem. They came out and punched the Niners in the nose. 24 to 7 at halftime. They had rushed for like 160 yards in the first half. And I'm like, wow. And then came the second half. And you knew that the 49ers had to make some kind of a push. But they're down 17. And this is where the coaching came in. Now, Dan Campbell is a coach of the year candidate. Uh, his emotion and his leadership has turned that team around. He is a very good coach. Not saying it, but he screwed up bad. And I've watched the Lions a lot this year, and I've noticed that it's fourth and five uh, on the other team's 20. He always goes for it. He's just, you know, and I'm like, at some point, that's going to come back and bite you. And boy, did it. So second half comes, 49ers go down, score a field goal. They kick a field goal. It's 24 to 10. And then the Lions go right down the field. And then the drive stalls. And it's fourth and three or something at the 20 to the 25. And they kick a field goal. And they go right back up by 17 and keep the pressure on the 49ers to score three times. But no. Dan Campbell channeled his inner Captain Rex Kramer from the movie Airplane. Maybe we ought to turn on the searchlights now. Uh oh. That's just what they'll be expecting us to do. That's right. We don't want to go up by 17. You know, we're going to go for it. And they got stuffed. No, that was the one where Goff threw a pass that could have been caught, maybe should have been caught, was thrown behind the guy. Anyhow, they did not complete it. San Francisco takes over. They go down and score. Now it's a seven-point game. And then, then Detroit fumbles. San Francisco takes it in again. Suddenly, we've got a tie game. And the tide is totally turned. Next thing you know, we're in the fourth quarter. San Francisco kicks a field goal. They're up by three, 27 to 24. And we're about midway through the fourth quarter. It's getting late. So, what happens? Deja vu. Detroit goes down. They get down to the 25 or something like that. Maybe the 20, I don't remember. It's fourth down and two. And Captain Rex Kramer strikes again. Maybe we ought to turn on the searchlights now. Uh oh. It's just what they'll be expecting us to do. They go for it. And they don't get it. So instead of kicking a field goal when you're halfway through the fourth quarter and tying the game and basically making it a toss-up from there on in, they're losing by three. And the 49ers now have the ball. And then Detroit was so stunned at that point that... They let the 49ers go right down the field to score a touchdown. It's 10 points, 34-24. So a 27-0 run the 49ers went on in the second half to pull that game out. So, yeah, um, that was tough. That had to be brutal for Detroit fans. Um, been there, done that. And so we have a San Francisco, Kansas City Super Bowl. You know the NFL's loving it because Taylor Swift is going to be there, presumably. Yes, I'm sick of the whole Kelsey and uh, Taylor Swift thing. Um, did you know that Kelsey was born in my hometown of Westlake, Ohio? That's right. Remember years ago when you said that the earth was cool.
side Cleveland Heights I think uh, the Kelsey brothers I think that's over near where the Golick brothers came from and they're following the same path uh, all-star all-pro and in Travis's case Hall of Fame I, I don't know enough about the offensive lineman creds for his brother Jason but um, they're gonna head into Hollywood I'm sure and kiss their uh, souls goodbye but of course there's Travis and Taylor, and that's the big deal. And of course, there's conspiracy theorists who think the NFL uh, has uh, put their thumb on the scales because they want the Swifties to tune in. Mm, I'm sure that's true. If Travis and Taylor break up right after the Super Bowl, you know that the fix was in. But that's another point. So who do I got in the Super Bowl? The Chiefs are going to win it. Um, San Francisco has shown that they are really up and down. Now, I am a Brock Purdy fan. He is the classic underdog. Uh, he doesn't have the strongest arm, but he's very accurate, very cool and composed. He's a leader, and he's shown it in these playoffs. But the Chiefs defense is underrated. I think the Chiefs defense, not the Ravens defense, and not my Browns defense, is the best in the league. Chiefs defense is really good. All the attention goes to Mahomes and Taylor Swift or Taylor Kelsey or Travis Swift, whatever it is. But the Chiefs defense is going to make the difference. Um, so I see Kansas City beating the 49ers. Um, I'm going to say it's going to be close. Let's say it's a three-point game. I get the Chiefs by three. Okay, so we are wrapping up football season, and we are in a new year. And a new year means new television shows, right? And there is that show, another reality show that everyone's tuning into. And that is, of course, Farmer Wants a Sheep. Oh, there's one now. <clears throat> you know, they... They could have done some sort of broke back mountain thing. That would have been kind of different. And it's 2024, which means two things. It's a leap year, meaning you have an extra day next month in the month of February. Um, but more importantly, we have a presidential election coming up. Yes, that's right. And we kind of know who the two candidates are going to be. That's right. We have a rematch, folks. It's Deja Fools all over again. Ah! Oh! <sighs> yes, here on A Very Odd Caster, we have a no politics policy, which we're going to partially waive for the 2024 season because it's all that's going to be talked about at some point. Um, and But our policy is generally when we make a heavily partisan political joke, uh, we get a big X and an electric shock that comes with it. Uh, we have special wiring and sensors here at Caster's Pub, which allows us to shock people when they cross the line and start spouting politics. So... Um, but it is 2024, and there's so much to look forward to, such as the debates. Oh, that is going to be great. You know, have they ever done a presidential debate from a nursing home before? 
I don't know. But we know that that's a possibility this year. So, oh, Jesus. Oh, I almost slipped that one in there. <laughs> oh, is that going to be, oh, it's going to be painful. <sighs> I think of Santa in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer when he says, oh, wake me when it's over. Oof, yeah. We shall overcome. And now, since it's been a while, since we've had an episode of A Very Odd Caster, um, oh, I wanted to point out that you might have noticed that here at Caster's Pub, you don't see any liquor out on display. That's because it's dry January. That's right. That's uh, one of these fads, you know. People come out on the holidays, they've been partying a lot. They're like, I'm doing dry January, right? Well, guess what? Caster's Pub's doing dry January too. No booze here at Caster's Pub. Now, I know we're a pub, so technically, you know, we're supposed to be selling booze, but hey, we want to be one of the cool kids. So yeah, we're doing dry January here at this pub. And usually, you know, you, we have people gathered around out in the, in the area, sitting down and, and along here at the bar. And you notice it's pretty quiet, right? I'm not sure. So business has been down a little bit. And I can't quite put my finger on why. So yes, it's dry January. And the next time we convene, there'll be booze out on display, as always. Uh, I'll be nipping, you know. Okay, so now we're going to pivot to some very odd news. These are true stories that actually happen. So we're going to kind of go back to the beginning of January um, to uh, recap some of the weird stories that have taken place. <laughs> this first one comes to us from Orlando, Florida, home of Mickey Mouse. Exploding toilet in a Duncan store in Florida left a customer filthy and injured, lawsuit claims. A customer has filed a negligence lawsuit against Duncan, claiming he was injured by an exploding toilet at one of the coffee chain's locations in central Florida. Paul Kerouac is seeking more than $100,000 in a lawsuit filed last Wednesday in state court in Orlando, claiming he suffered severe and long-term injuries following the explosion of a toilet in the men's room of a Duncan's location in Winter Park, Florida, a year ago. After the explosion left Kerwick covered in human feces, urine, and debris, he walked out of the men's room seeking help from workers and the store's manager, according to the lawsuit. An employee told him that they were aware of the problem with the toilet since there had been previous incidents the lawsuit says, without diving, see what I did there, into further details about the explosion. Imagine, this comes from January 4th. So imagine starting your new year like that. What if, what if Paul Kerouac for his new year's resolution said, this year, whenever I take a shit in a public restroom, the toilet's never going to explode on me. How does a toilet explode? I mean, you know that people using the toilet might explode. Mm, yucky. But how does a toilet explode? Is that methane? And someone goes in there, does their business, and says, hey, 
This one's really stinky. I think I'll light a match. Is that what happens? What? And then the employees say there was a problem with the toilet. It sounds like the things, sounds like these explosions have happened before. I mean, they ought to move that thing into the uh, circus, right? Step right up, step right up and see the exploding toilet. <clears throat> it's going to be hard to top that one. Or maybe not. This one comes to us from Leeds, Alabama. Nude man nabbed by police after cannonball plunge into giant aquarium at Bass Pro Shop in Alabama. This story comes to us from January 5th. So, you know, it was January 6th Eve, right? So, you know, he was going to storm down to the Capitol and take over the government, but forgot his clothes, forgot his weapon, and was drunk as shit. So, oops. Yet, his hair remains perfect. <clears throat> okay, so, let's break this down. A man crashed his car outside a Bass Pro Shop in Alabama, stripped down to his birthday suit, and plunged into the giant aquarium inside the store. <sighs> the ordeal happened Thursday night in front of shocked shoppers in the town just outside Birmingham. Leeds Police Chief Paul Irwin said. Are we sure it wasn't Steve Irwin? By God, and we're, we're here at the aquarium in Leeds, Alabama. And bought these gorgeous, gorgeous stuffed animals all over the wall on display. And crikey, there's creaky and crocky cookie. <laughs> oh, look at this beautiful species floating around in the... <clears throat> Aquarium. Gorgeous. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Steve Irwin's not with us anymore, so that couldn't have possibly happened. Okay, so the 42-year-old Alabama man did a, <laughs> did a cannonball leap into the aquarium and then stood under a waterfall. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Oh, God. Wow, we're off to a good start. He left the water to go yell at the two police officers, then dove back into the aquarium. Hey, motherfucker, leave me alone here. I'm trying to have my beauty swim. He cannonball. Holy shit. Well... At least the man has a bright future in Alabama politics. Oh, Jesus Louise. All right, so, man, that was just two stories. I need a drink. Well, I need a real drink, but of course, it's dry January, and I own a pub. <clears throat> Next, this story is from Lexington, Kentucky. E.T. Welcome. Kentucky City beams message into space, inviting extraterrestrial visitors. A Kentucky city has come up with an out-of-this-world campaign to promote tourism. The Lexington Convention and Visitors Bureau used an infrared laser to beam a message into space to invite extraterrestrial travelers. They could have just put up a billboard in L.A. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> oh, God. 
you know, <laughs> it seems like kind of weird and a waste of resources. Um, but, you know, I think the town is just expanding their tourism outreach. That's pretty smart, right? But what about people out there who identify as extraterrestrials? Hmm? Elliot, where is my bathroom? I'm not going there. The toilet might explode. Linking two odd news stories together. Aren't you impressed? Woohoo! Okay. All right. Some really good stories this month. Oh, this next one comes to us from across the pond in Wolverhampton, England. A soccer fan plucked from the crowd to officiate an FA Cup match couldn't cheer when his team scored. Oh, man. You talk about restraint. A fan of English soccer club Wolverhampton was unable to celebrate his team's late winner in an FA Cup replay because he'd been plucked from the crowd to stand in as a match official. Ross Bennett attended the Wolves-Brentford game on Tuesday with his 11-year-old son and volunteered to fill in as the fourth official in the technical area near the dugouts following an injury to one of the assistant referees in extra time. Bennett, a qualified referee at the youth level, said he was given a crash course on how to work the substitutes board and dealt with questions from members of the Brentford staff in a tense end to the match at Molino. Molino? Molinux? I'm not going to look it up. Somewhere in England. The hardest part of his new job might have been when Matthias Kunha converted the penalty that ultimately sealed a 3-2 win for Wolves and an eagerly anticipated fourth round match against local rival West Bromwich Albion. I was just gutted that I couldn't celebrate our goal, Bennett told the BBC. I had to stay neutral. So, doesn't it seem like when the Kansas City Chiefs are playing that they're plucking people out of the stands to uh, referee? I know I got some support on that one. I don't know. You know, I coached uh, baseball for 20 years, youth baseball. And, um, you know, you're always shorthanded, so you're always filling. And that's why I have a bad hip because I... Like an idiot. Uh, we were short players. I ran the bases and ripped something, and now I, I limp. Little boogers. Uh, anyhow, yeah, so you know, you got to fill in and whatnot. And there's times when you're scrimmaging where you, you, you don't have any official umpires. And so, you know, sometimes the, the coaches or one of the dads will go out there and call balls and strikes and basically umpire the scrimmage. And so I've had to do that, you know. And, you know, it's funny when you're, when my son's up there, you know, and, you know, he gets a hit. And I'm like, eh, you know, and the ball's like five feet fall. It's like, oh, fair ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, good, good boy. Nice job. Oh, man. Uh, so it would be tough to be an official. It is tough to be an official at any level. Um, that reminds me, by the way, of another stupid ass thing from my childhood. And this is actually one that I've told before, but we're going to do a flashback. So we're going back to Little League. I'm going to say I was 13 or 14 and, uh, I had a bunch of my good friends on my team and we were playing another team who, and that team had a bunch of good friends of mine too. So it was always a fun game. It was kind of a, a 
a uh, bragging rights thing because we kind of, uh, we were a better team, of course. <clears throat> but uh, they beat us, we beat them, so on and so forth. We wound up meeting in the championship and it was a three game best of three series and we won, but barely two games to one. You know, we lost the first one. We were, we had our backs against the wall and came back and won a close one. Anyhow, so there's kind of a rivalry here. Uh, a lot of buddies on that team. And this one game, it wasn't in the in the championship, it was during the season. Uh, the coach of the other team, who was the father of a friend of mine, was a hothead. And I forget what he was pissed at, but he went after the umpire. And the umpire was a pimply-faced 13-year-old kid or something like that. You know, uh, or not much older than that. And this dude was a big, burly guy. And he got right in the poor kid's face. He was arguing something. I'm sure it probably was a bad call. I don't know. And I'm standing out there watching this. And uh, the kid, you know, his, his the acne on his face started to glow because he just like... Then he goes... Coach, you're out of here. You know, with that much force. And the coach is like, what? Coach, you're ejected. You have to leave the premises now. <sighs> and then, like some of the other coaches, hey, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. So... A hot head coach. Who, by, by the way, he was a good dude. He just had a temper. He just had his priorities a little wrong. Finally, he turned and stalked off. And I remember I was out in the field and I watched him stomping off away from the, the dugout, out into the road and across towards the parking lot. And I remember thinking, So, uh, never, I never got ejected uh, as a coach, but you know, I felt like getting ejected a few times. But anyhow, that was another stupid ass thing from my childhood. Okay, next up from Phoenix, Arizona, all the way to Tacoma. Philadelphia, Atlanta, LA. No joke, humorous electronic messages on highways will soon disappear. <sighs> A federal agency is discouraging humorous and quirky messages that could distract or confuse drivers on highways and freeways across the country. The Federal Highway Administration recently released an updated 1,100 page manual that spells out how signs and other traffic control devices are regulated. In it, the agency strongly recommends against overhead electronic signs with obscure meanings, references to pop culture, or those intended to be funny. <sighs> well, what a shocker, the government suppressing free speech. It's not like that's happened in recent years. Oh, jeez. Man, I'm going to be like Don King before I know it. And then there, there's uh, this one. Uh, I kind of got cut off, but the headline is uh, uh, From a Ludicrously Capacious Bag to Fake Sausages. Succession Props, you know, the show, Succession. Succession props draw luxurious prizes. So I guess these capacious bags are one of the main props on this show. And uh, I guess this, this includes fake sausages. <laughs> now, come on, can't we just come right out and say the word dildos? Uh, 
I've never seen the show Succession, so maybe I'm a bit off here. Could go on all day with these odd news stories, but we're going to just do one more. This comes to us from Overland Park, Kansas. Kansas couple charged with collecting man's retirement while keeping his body in their home for six years. A Kansas couple has been charged with fraudulently collecting more than $215,000 in retirement benefits on behalf of a dead relative while they concealed his body inside their home for six years. Authorities say Mike Carroll's pacemaker showed that he died in 2016 at age 81, but Overland Park police didn't discover his body until 2022 after his son-in-law, Kurt Ritter, called police to report his death in the Kansas City suburb. Prosecutors say Lynn Ritter and Kirk Ritter, both 61, continued depositing and spending from Carroll's bank account even while his body became mummified on a bed in the home he owned. Oh, and by the way, Lynn Ritter is Carol's daughter. So fathers, be good to your daughters, or else daughters will let you rot until you're mummified so she can scam your retirement benefits. Ah, yes. Eat your heart out, John Mayer. Okay, um, so those were the very odd news stories for this past month. Now we are going to pick up where we left off in our segment called Dumb, Idiotic, and Useless. Uh, We've had four installments of this. So to, to give you a quick history, oh, last summer we underwent a extensive renovation here at Caster's Pub. And that included um, the installation of a ceiling on a studio that is adjacent to the pub. Of course, right? It was quite an ordeal and I documented it in my own DIY video. And so here is part five from that project. Well, I'm definitely glad that I gave drywall a chance because kids, we now have the beginnings of a ceiling. There's the initial corner, as you can see there, yeah. And then, <clears throat> this is what we did yesterday. The other end of it, that has been my savior. This tall ladder and this inch and a half thick piece of wood, it's been my savior. Now note, you're probably like, oh, nice. You made, you, you made an accurate cut. Look at that. He, he measured it perfectly. An accurate cut for the light fixture. Well, don't get too excited. Here, come with me. And we're gonna go to the other end of the corner. And uh, let's see, okay, this is the opposite end here. And we're gonna check out and we're gonna see, uh, let's see the, wait a minute. What the hell is that? Get closer. Holy cow, another, another hole. Like, like a light fixture was supposed to go there or something. Yeah, I'm coming clean. I put the hole in the wrong end. I'm gonna have to tape over that and mud it down and sand it and everything. How? 
may you ask, did I do such a stupid thing? Well, one problem was I was rushing. I was trying to get that second piece in and I was rushing a bit. But I was having a major brain fart measuring the hole because it's not right in the middle, it's not right at the end, and there's a back side of the drywall and there's a front side of the drywall. And what I wound up doing was putting that original hole in the back side of the drywall. And at first I thought, huh, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. So, <clears throat> and the problem I was having is, as, as I was standing above the four by eight slab of drywall, I'm like, okay, now if you split it, if you turn it over, which end is that corner? Which end is that corner? Where, where exactly is the hole? And I was worried about it. I was like, this, this could be a problem. And it was a problem. So, but live and, I would say live and learn, but I, I never learn. But it's up there and you may, when it's all painted, you may say a little circle there. Oh well, this isn't meant to be perfect anyhow, right? This is a DIY project. Dumb, idiotic, and useless. Ah, it's coming down to crunch time on the old project. Stay tuned for the next installment. And now on this month's musical segment, uh, I bring you a brand new original. This one's dedicated to the island girl. Well, there's three sides to every story.
That's what she said That's what he said as well Once they were lovers Now you can't hardly tell Can't tell a book by its cover Cause the pages in between Tell the true story Of two broken dreams Well, there's three sides to every story We have a glass of gin and vermouth There's three sides to every story His side, her side, and the truth Well, there's three sides to every story We go and ask John Wilkes Her side and the truth. His side, her side and the truth. And you heard it here first on a very odd caster. Now, before we close out, uh, I wanted to uh, turn to another. One of our memes and things. That's right. Each episode, I like picking out a meme that I've come across, usually online somewhere, to share it with you. And, you know, I've been zapped a lot in this episode for crossing the line on political commentary. Again, it's, it's because it's 2024, so it's going to happen. Sorry. <clears throat> but uh, this particular meme caught my eye, and it's basically a spoof of a children's book, and it is called Everyone I Don't Like is Hitler, a child's guide to online political discussion. No further comment on that one. Well, anyhow... Have a great uh, rest of the month. Valentine's Day is coming up, so make sure to give your sweetheart flowers, candy, and the shirt off your back, maybe, if you're lucky. Ciao!